Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Um, so I'm here to. We are going to do this in two parts. I'm here. I'm. I'm going to present the um, general things about Torch, and then um, um, one of my friends from Facebook is going to specifically talk about the kinds of extensions and the kinds of things that they have been doing recently um, in Facebook. So Torch has been. Um, it's a framework for scientific computing for Lua or Lua JIT. Um, it's a debate, um, but Luajit is a very efficient, um, very efficient version of Lua. It has it has too many advantages. It has a very small number of disadvantages, depending on what you want to do. Most of the time, you want to use Luajit and gain all those advantages. Um, so Torch has been around um, for many many years. It has actually been started by um, Semi Bangio and Ronan Kolber mostly. And um, Ronan has been always the main developer for many years, I think since 2000 or 1990s. I don't exactly remember when he's very old. Um, <laughs> and um, there was versions like, I think, 1, 3, 5, and this is version 7. For some reason, it's always odd numbers. And um, the version 7 is the one where it's actually actively pushing for Lua and Lua JIT being very much integrated into the, into the Torch framework. Um, there's a website, of course, torch.ch, and then everything goes on in the in the in, on on GitHub. Um, it is it is structured such that um, it is actually not just one project; it is tens of projects. Those are all um, tens of little Lua packages, and um, you get one, you get all the dependencies, just like any package mechanism. Um, there's a good cheat sheet that you might want to check out. Sumit Chintala um, has put together this. It 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 basically summarizes everything that you would want to do and then how you would do that in Torch and then there are some tutorials and maybe most importantly there's the Lua's and Lua Jit's main website where you want to learn about Lua and Lua Jit. Okay so I mentioned several things here so um, Torch has always been a, a very sort of open source and like um, company friendly because uh, it has BSD license so that um, companies and people in industry can use it it has um, lots of little packages, but the main, main focus has always been um, large-scale neural networks and um, online learning. And um, so far, I think Clemon gathered these statistics. There has been more than like 50,000 downloads. There are many, I wouldn't say many, there are several universities that are using this and major industrial labs. So um, I was part of the DeepMind startup since we got bought by Google. Uh, now, um, inside Google, there's, um, we are using this officially something like 50-70% research group uses it. I think Facebook uses it right now for research. And then now Clemon joined Twitter, they, are sta they have started using it. So we are seeing some sort of good um, industrial support as the um, Nicholas from Facebook is going to give you some examples of what they have been doing. And... Um, Okay, so I want to talk about, so the, the torch is not much different than when you think about it on the face of it. It's not much different than you would have something like Python and NumPy and SciPy or like people who come from academia MATLAB. So why, um, so first of all, like why a mixed language ab approach? Because um, John just talked about the Volpa Webit, which is um, one big application. Um, the reason for that is we want to create um, complex applications, not just on one domain. It's a general purpose system. You want to do anything. And um, you want to have a scripting language so that you can interact with it. You have data sets. You want to play with those. You want to look at your data. You want to do some exploration around your ideas. Interpreted environments are really nice for that. And LuaJIT and Lua gives us that. Lua is a very, very simple interpreted language. It's actually I don't. I haven't seen anything simpler. Like it, I think it takes two days to understand what is going on with the language. Um, but once you have this, what is important is you need to have a uh, you need to have a good backend because you, just because you do you do in you interpreted development, you do scripting, it doesn't mean that you want to compromise on the speed. 
right? So you always want to have your backend, the algorithm implementation fast. And then with Lua and LuaJIT, this gives us this gives us a perfect perfect space because it is very easy to interface with C and C from Lua, and especially from um, and especially from LuaJIT. So with Torch, what we have is we have a good backend, which is um, C. Almost every numerical um, routine is implemented in C, C++. We have a, something like an equivalent of NumPy. And then there is the, there's the CUDA port, and we use OpenMP for certain things. And then, um, and then the, the advantages of LuaJIT, um, one of the main advantages is it is, I think, still the fastest scripting language um, that is out there. Um, for certain things, actually, there are benchmarks showing that it is actually as fast as C. And then um, if you have a data that you say um, you allocated in C, just a high level, say something like a NumPy tensor, you can actually loop through it in Lua space as much as you would loop through that in C. Certain operations, you can do that fast. This gives us a, a great ability to actually stay at the high level, implement algorithms very quickly, and then don't compromise on the speed. It is very simple. It's very readable as I said, and then um, the interface to C is very, very clean, especially with something like, like um, FFI. Um, Logit has a, its own FFI implementation, of course. Sometimes there is no interface. It's just you get the pointer to your data and you use it directly in Lua. And um, another big advantage is um, Lua, Lua is a very, very small language. It is, it is um, several tens of files, couple kilobytes, um, and when you compile everything together, you can you can you can embed it in iPhones and video games and everything. Actually, Lua has been around for a for a long while, and it has been very popular with video games because those guys want um, to have good script scripting languages that they can embed. One design choice that is important that has been for Lua is um, Lua doesn't need to be the main application that you are running. It is actually by design is an embeddable language so that if you have a C++ application, Lua is just a, just a library that you link with and you can start actually scripting even from your C++ application, which this in turn means that everything that we do in Torch becomes a library that can be linked into any other application. Okay, so this is, um, I think I have answered many things here, but this, is, this always comes up. Why didn't we just use Python? And then one, one main advantage is, as I said, speed. The other is we wanted to build applications so that it's self-contained, it's there. Um, porting, it's very important. And we want to be able to, so something like FFI, um, as you can imagine, um, the advantages translate into being able to wrap libraries very, very easily. One thing that you won't have with Lua compared to Python is the millions of packages that people have done for you. So most of the time, you would find yourself that um, like the the availability of packages are not as good as Python. This is a, this is a, this is the reality. But then you wanna you wanna wrap something. You wanna wrap a library and use it, right? It is very very easy. I'm not sure if it gets easier than that. But um, people can check out um, examples of what we have in Torch or like that is around. Um, okay, so I'll just um, talk about Lua a little bit. It's as I said, it's a very simple language and um, it has only one data structure. And it's a table, and that's it. And um, a table, it also, um, it's it's at the same time it's an array. It's a it's a hash table, and it's a struct. It's a list. It's everything. So you can you can have simple numbers. My table one two three, and then you're going to be able to index it with, with my table of one, my table of two three, or you can you can you can have um, string um, string um, elements, or you can combine them. And then you can, um, you can index the table with anything. Functions are, um, which is very important, functions are first level citizens of the language. So you can even have keys of your table as your functions. So that this means that um, any object that you have in Lua, you can have a hash map from that object to any other object. This is a very powerful construct. And once you have this, it is actually very, very hard to let go. And then the other thing is um, to complete everything. Of course, it supports closures. And with these two tables and closures, with tables as powerful like this and closures, you can pretty much do anything you want. The language itself isn't, doesn't have any object-oriented um, support in itself. But 
by, by using these, um, these mechanisms, there are many extensions that is out there, which, is, which we also have a particular one in Torch, that you can actually emulate object-oriented programming. And we, be, we, we keep writing classes and inheritances and things like that. But in the end, those are just tables and functions, which make me actually feel better. OK, so um, Torch. As I said, um, there are tables, but tables in the end are not the, um, are not the real solution if you want to do large scale uh, machine learning and if you want to play with neural nets and everything, right? So what Torch provides is, is, is one, at the core of it, it's a very crucial component. It's a tensor object. It's an n-dimensional array. And basically, a tensor is a view over a chunk of memory. You have a memory. And think about this in MATLAB. You have multi-dimensional arrays, right? But in the end, in the memory space, it's just one-dimensional memory. And as opposed to MATLAB, what you have is that um, not every tensor has to have a distinct um, memory. You can have a chunk of memory, and you can have any number of tensors viewing that memory, or even parts of that memory, with different shapes. This is, this is achieved through, so you have a, you have a memory space. Uh, we have a storage object that wraps around that memory space, and it, it sort of manages it in the sense that you can, um, you can ask the storage object to allocate more memory or less memory. So this is your memory interface. And the tensor is a structure over that where you have your storage, you have your offset, so that, OK, I'm going to start from this location in my memory. And um, I'm going to have, say, a six-dimensional array. And then stride is something that gives you the ability to say that in each dimension, I'm going to jump this much in my memory. So with this, with this, you can actually construct any n-dimensional arrays. I think this is not, um, this is not something new. Um, Leon and Jan, when they did their LASH, they had exactly the same structure. And then I think it is pretty similar structure in NumPy. And then this, this structure is very powerful, and it is at the core of everything. And then you can imagine that we have, um, we have double tensors, float tensors, integers, bytes. CUDA tensors is just another type of tensor. And then what you do is you implement all your, all your linear algebra operations in terms of these tensors and provide, a, um, provide the interface to, to these in the Lua space. So that in the Lua space, no matter what type of tensor you want to create, you can create it. And what type of linear algebra operation you want to do, matrix operations, vector operations, convolutions, all sorts of things um, you can do. Um, I'm actually not able to keep track of time here. So I don't know how am I going. OK. <laughs> um, OK. OK, so we have a bunch of packages, of course. And then um, like packages for image manipulation, plotting, random numbers, and any Lua package that you can see out there, you can use it. Because as I said, Torch and all the other packages that depend on Torch that we wrote are just Lua packages. Um, there's Qt. Uh, interface that was written by Leon, and then it provides you to create uh, GUI applications, which um, at least in DeepMind we use it every day. And then, um, as I said, the structure, like you have your low-level packages, there's the tensor library on top of it, and then there's the Lua C API that you have, we have another library that provides um, high-level functions over it. And all the packages that you write basically uses these three libraries. and um, do their job. They can be all in the Lua level. They can be also have C implementations. They can have GPU modules and everything. But these, these libraries provide you everything. If you want to do more, of course, you can do more. You can do, go directly to your own library and everything. But I think this provides, um, this provides you everything. There's the package manager, of course. And this is a generic package manager that we didn't write. This is the Lua Rux package manager that is available for Lua. And we just provide a set of packages that are related to Torch. That's all we do. So um, I want to talk briefly about the NN package, because this is, this is like the core of uh, why, how Torch started, uh, like at least the recent version. And um, this, this, this gives you the ability to create neural network, um, a very, um, any, any type of neural network you can imagine. I, can, I think I want to claim that you would be able to create with this. Um, OK, so it is, it, it's a very simple interface. Basically, you have a module. Any neural network layer is a module. And what you have is you need to implement um, three functions. Um, and then with those three functions, you are going to do your forward evaluation of your module, and then the backward, which is going to calculate the derivatives with respect to your input and the derivatives with respect to your weights in your module. And basically, what a neural network is, a combination of these modules put together in some form. And then you connect these, and then um, 
you do gradient based optimization you go forward backward you evaluate your network and then you go backward depending um, you calculate your loss and you calculate the derivatives with respect to your loss and um, everything everything is simple from that point on um, in the neural network library as I said, we, had, um, we have optimized backends. Uh, when we use CPU, we use OpenMP and SSE so that um, you have parallelization in your convolutions and many other operations. And then um, they are efficient. And when you use GPU, we use CUDA. Um, there are two packages, as I said, Torch is packages, lots of packages. QTorch is a package that gives you the, um, so the, the transfer library is by default on, um, on CPU. There's a version that extends it to GPU, which is QTorch, and QNN is the uh, version of NN that extends it to GPU. And um, I'll show a quick example showing that um, switching from CPU to GPU is basically, say, you create an object. It lives on the CPU space. You say column CUDA, and then it shifts to GPU. And then from that point on, everything that you do with that happens on GPU. Anyways, performance is important, right? So Sumit has created a set of benchmarks. On this website, you can check all those benchmarks and then see how things um, fare. Um, bum, bum, bum. OK, I think I'm going to skip these parts. I want to show this quickly, which is um, how you would create a, a, a standard convolutional network. Um, this, is a, whoa. This, is a convolution, this is a container object. It's basically going to put blocks on top of each other. going to create a convolutions, tan h, max pooling, Normalization, convolution, tan h, max pooling, normalization, and then linear layer and logs of max. And I'm going to minimize it with, um, um, say, some loss. And this is basically it. This is how you would define a standard feed forward neural net. When it comes to more complicated neural networks, the code becomes a little bit more complicated. But in the end, this gives you the high level ability to construct neural networks very, very easily. There's all sorts of nonlinearities and standard modules that you can find in the neural network library and extensions of it that I really think you shouldn't be able to um, write anything more. And um, these are, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, I'm going to mention another thing. Some neural networks are harder because they don't fit into these um, Lego like blocks where you can put blocks on top of each other, like feed forwards or parallels and things like that. There's a graph library that you can basically create any sort of um, connections. This is the implementation of the LSTM recurrent neural network. I don't think it's much longer than how you would write it on the paper. And then um, these are all things, modules that are already in the, in the neural network library. You just write them as you would write the functions. And then you would get this sort of structure, which is going to be implementing your um, LSTM. And then CUDA, the last point I wanted to make. Um, say I have a network. I put the network on CUDA. From that point on, I, I, I create my input on the, on, the, on, the, on the device, on the CUDA tensor. And um, I do module forward input. This runs on your GPU, right? And um, this is basically the, the ability to switch from CPU to GPU is this much. If you don't need to write any new modules, which I'm saying claiming that 99% of the time it's going to be that, then this is, this, is, this is basically that. I think at this point, Nicolas should come because um, he's going to talk about things that they have, they have been doing in, um, in, in Facebook. One thing I want to mention is we have been doing reinforcement learning in DeepMind using Torch a lot, which goes back to John's point about um, causation and exploration. And um, it, is, it is a very important part of the research domain nowadays. And, um, there are many libraries that we haven't made open source yet. Maybe we should. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to. Um. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Yes, hi, everyone. I'm Nicholas. I'm uh, from Facebook. Um, so Facebook has started using Torch uh, earlier this year. So Jan LeCun joined uh, uh, Facebook uh, in December last year. And ever since, we started uh, playing with Torch. and. Um, Here's currently what, we, what we're doing. So um, first of all, we've been um, doing a, a bunch of uh, open source contributions that I'm going to talk about. And um, the other thing we're working on is mostly um, performance, so uh, partisan multi-GPU and um, better communications for, for bigger um, parallel computations, uh, as well as kernel speed. So everything we've been uh, releasing uh, is going to this um, Facebook FB Lua Lib uh, uh, GitHub. 
and so I'm going to talk about these open source contributions. Um, so we released a bunch of packages. Um, so here's the list of everything we released. So um, there's a thrift uh, a serialization library that I'm going to describe, uh, a debugger uh, for, for Lua. Um, a bridge uh, between Lua and Python, which allows you to write Python and, and inter interoperate, interoperate with, um, with Lua. Um, some C++ uh, utilities that um, have been quite helpful for us to write also unit tests and things like that. Um, and different uh, utilities and, and uh, also some uh, abilities to um, uh, write .mat um, uh, MATLAB files without even having MATLAB installed for <laughs> um, better collaboration. So I'm going first to talk about FB Thrift. So um, Thrift is a um, uh, multi-platform, multi-language uh, serialization uh, that we use in production at Facebook. So actually, the servers, the big uh, Facebook servers, run Thrift uh, serialization all the time. It has built-in optional compression. And uh, with Thrift, uh, we've basically built serialization and deserialization of Lua objects. Um, and we support, I would say, basic types and um, most importantly, the Torch tensor, which is the um, main uh, piece of data that we're working on. And any arbitrary um, cyclic object graph composed of these things. And it's been pretty successful in the sense that um, we do observe speeds between three and eight times uh, uh, faster than the Tor serialization, so it's pretty convenient to use. Um, and so how would you, for instance, uh, serialize and deserialize an object? So you would require the, uh, the package um, and then basically load an object and just turn it to a string, and that's serialized. And you can serialize, deserialize, dump into a file, get it from a file, get the object back, and everything is done transparently. You can activate compression if you want. And you can even use these things to send them over a network and uh, everything that comes with uh, serialization um, using Thrift. So the second piece that we've been uh, releasing is this uh, uh, debugger, which is uh, really a full featured source level Lua debugger. So um, you don't require Torch. It's really a, a Lua side uh, debugger. and it, it works really two-way, so it's built on top of uh, GDB and, and has very similar uh, um, interface. Um, and so you have two ways um, of using it. So either you just embed some uh, uh, code, you just say debugger enter um, at a particular piece where you want to inspect uh, your, uh, uh, your code. Um, or you can also have it launch automatically as soon as you have an exception, and that's very convenient to actually get from Lua into the C code and see what's, what's happening if um, something uh, bad happens. You can debug the library you've been writing, things like that. Um, also plugs nicely with the CUDA GDB. It's, it's all automated by using this uh, Lua debug on error uh, flag. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about is this um, fb.python, uh, sorry, which is really a bridge between Lua and Python. So really, you can communicate between the two languages. You can write a mix of both languages. So you can really use SciPy with the Lua tensors and benefit from all the optimization execute on CUDA, writing Python code uh, or SciPy. Um, and um, yeah, you just work as if it were NumPy arrays, and there's an on-the-fly data conversion that happens uh, for you. Um, the way it works is basically we have two main methods. There's this py exec and py eval that you call from Lua, who to, uh, into which you specify some Python code. And um, you can execute that code in Python from Lua and pass objects around. And um, so there's some technicalities with the data model, just talking about them very high level, but they, they, they're all described very well in the, um, on the GitHub. Um, basically, Lua and Python don't have the same data model, so you need to tra uh, translate between, between the two. There is, um, it's, not, it's not a perfect conversion, so it's an approximation, it's a heuristic, um, and sometimes you need, you need more, so we have solutions also for that. But basically, the data are always transferred by value, um, the tables are copied deeply, um, except the tensors, which share the data. Uh, so everyone accesses to that same pointer that Corey was talking about, we, which contains the data. But then the view is translated, and the view is peanuts. It's a few bytes. 
And um, effectively, what, what, what this means is you can allocate, create a new uh, uh, NumPy array, and then pass it to Lua and run Torch libraries on it without making any copy, just the small metadata. So that's very, very fast and efficient. Um, <clears throat> so for more complex types, we also have these uh, 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 opaque references, which allows you to uh, basically pass data around in, in a chain manner within, uh, within Python, uh, different Python methods. So I will show you about this. Uh, we should wrap up. We're out of time. OK, so I will go very quickly for these things. So there's examples. You can find them also on the GitHub. But basically, you can run uh, Python code. You can uh, import some NumPy, transpose it, eval, and then tokenize from Lua using Python data structures. And that's pretty much it. <laughs>